celestial signals. God is trying to communicate with us in a supernatural way. The meaning of the four blood moons and their message. We're going to see something dramatic happen in the Middle East. Plus, voices in his head. Kill, you gotta kill. Driving him to murder. I said to those voices, now are you satisfied? Delivered from demons. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. Well, isn't it nice, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 700 Club. We have a president who said unequivocally, if you like your health care plan, you can keep it. Unless, of course, we decide that your plan doesn't fit our goals. And more recently, he said, Obamacare is the law of the land, unless I decide that I'm not going to obey it. And so he just decided yesterday that he was going to change a part of the law passed by Congress that uh, calls for small businesses to uh, be under the uh, individual mandate, uh, the corporate mandate. And he says, we're going to suspend that for a year or so. There's no way that a president should do that. Congress has said, this is the way it, it, it is. You asked for this law. We gave it to you. Mm -hmm. Now, Obama says, but I, I don't like it. I think we ought to change it. Well, Obamacare has created, needless to say, serious political problems for Democrats. Even the major media say some of its defenders are not always telling the truth. John Waggy has the story. The Senate's second highest ranking Democrat is under fire after saying Obamacare added millions of new Americans to the health care rolls. Ten million Americans have health insurance today who would not have had it without the Affordable Care Act. Ten million. And we can also say this, it is going to reduce the deficit more than we thought it would. We are seeing a decline in the growth of the cost of health care, exactly our goal in passing this original legislation. But Monday's Washington Post fact checker labeled the foundation of Durbin's remarks ridiculous, saying the vast majority of enrollees were previously insured. Republicans were quick to counter Durbin's optimistic claims. Well, I can tell you that uh, Senator Durbin can spin this all he wants, but I hear it from my constituents. They've been writing me concerned about higher health care costs, losing their plans or their doctor, and also just concerns about a disastrous rollout, gross incompetence. Democrats say that when Americans see the law at work, voter fears will subside. Uh, what we are going to see, we think, is that first of all, costs are much less than we had predicted them to be. So it's actually costing us less. Health care costs have been driven down. There's now more health facilities available in our community. People are using emergency rooms less. All that's going to be positive on our economy. But if it's not positive or voters don't think it's positive, Democrats run the risk of facing a single-issue tsunami in November's congressional elections. Republicans need to gain six seats to take control of the Senate. In almost every case, the numbers that we're now looking at, whether it's the cost of insurance, the people that are uninsured, or the people that just simply uh, aren't working full time is, is a bigger number and a harder to deal with number than anybody who voted for this law uh, thought it would be. I didn't vote for it. I don't think it, it has the capacity to work, but all the numbers as they come out uh, exceed the bad news that had been anticipated. For now, Democrats hope the exemptions granted to businesses and some individuals will help put off much of the debate for the next election. John Waggy, CBN News. Isn't that appalling? You've got men in office who aren't telling the truth. Uh, we've had that through ever in politics. There have been a bunch of liars. <laughs> Mark Twain had some rather interesting statements to talk about the political class. But <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, uh, what we have now is, is lack of faith in government. I think the people are really turned off by government. Well, we can't control the weather, but I guess people would like to. We want to find out what's going on. And another major winter storm is heading for the East Coast and the South. John Jessup has that story from Washington. Here's John. Pat, this could be the biggest storm yet in some areas. The forecast across the South calls for a dangerous mix of snow and ice. The storm is expected to dump more snow in Georgia than the two inches that paralyzed Atlanta two weeks ago. That winter storm created gridlock on interstates in Atlanta, forcing some people to sleep in their cars and trapping thousands of students in their schools. 
Now forecasters predict Georgia could see the most significant ice storm in 10 to 20 years. State officials say this time they're ready. Georgia's governor declared a state of emergency ahead of the storm. We are making every effort to be prepared for these events. And I would simply say that we should all individually use extreme caution. Temperatures and precipitation are expected to create an icy mess from northeast Texas into the Carolinas. Planned Parenthood is paying $2 million to the family of, an, of a botched abortion victim. In 2012, Tanya Reeves bled to death at a Planned Parenthood in Chicago. The Thomas More Society, a legal group based in Chicago, calls the payment hush money. Last year, the group filed a complaint requesting an investigation into the clinic responsible for the botched abortion, but no action has been taken. The Thomas More Society has renewed its call for stronger abortion clinic inspections and regulation in Illinois. Well, former child star Shirley Temple has died at age 85. Temple was the number one movie star from 1935 to 1938, a record no other child actor has ever come close to. Her popularity has been credited for helping save 20th Century Fox from bankruptcy, but she once said her greatest roles were as wife, mother, and grandmother. She was married to Charles Black for 54 years and was also active in politics, holding several diplomatic posts and serving as ambassador to Czechoslovakia under the first President Bush when communism was overthrown. Pat, I understand you met Shirley Temple. I did. When I was uh, right after the Iron Curtain fell uh, and there was an opening in Eastern Europe, I was traveling in that area to see what we could do about uh, establishing relationship and ministry and getting the program here on the air. And uh, I had a meeting with her. She's a very lovely lady. And uh, uh, of course, I wanted to talk about Hollywood and she wanted to talk about politics. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she, she, you know, the child star thing, she'd long since passed, but she was one cute little girl. And uh, that talented, question, incredibly oh, talented child. Dance mm -hmm. and everything. And the American people loved her. And, and uh, she was, you know, the number one box office draw. I think one of the most refreshing things about her was with all that success, she seemed to always have her head on straight. Well, she did. And she was a very successful ambassador. She was an all business knew exactly what was going and I remember she said the air pollution is so bad in uh, in Czechoslovakia I guess we're in Prague and she said it's like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day uh -huh. just being uh, breathing the air it was just terrible so we had a it was a nice time and it was uh, memorable and I'm glad I had a chance to visit with her John Pat, archaeologists have been making major discoveries at an excavation site in Israel, including a synagogue that Jesus may have visited. Chris Mitchell brings us that story from Galilee. The village is called Magdala, the home of Mary Magdalene. She lived here, and she met uh, Jesus here, and she continued with him. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's the place. Israeli archaeologist Arfin Najjar oversees the excavation at Magdala, he says the city lay hidden all this time by just a small layer of dirt. Some place almost this, you touch the surface and you have the wall. Mm -hmm. Waiting for us to 2000 years to when we were coming. The most important discovery here in Magdala has been a synagogue dating back to the time of Jesus. According to archaeologists, it's the first synagogue uncovered in the Galilee. An expression that appears many times in several places of the gospel. Jesus went around Galilee preaching in their synagogues. So this is the closest synagogue to Capernaum where he lived. So most likely he was here many times. In it, they discovered a 2,000 year old treasure. They call it the Magdala Stone. And some archeologists say it's the most important discovery in decades. CBN News first reported on the stone just after it was uncovered in 2009. Father Kelly of the Catholic Order, Legionnaires of Christ, showed us a replica while overlooking the Temple Mount. This particular Magdala stone is the most important discovery ever made related to the Second Temple, the Temple at the time of Jesus, which Herod redid. So that's uh, quite the statement. The menorah on the stone is one of a kind, the first one discovered before the destruction of the Temple in 70 A.D. The Legionnaires of Christ own the land and are building an entire center at Magdala with an archaeological park, hotel, and spiritual center. Father Solana dreamed up the project and wants it to be a center for all. I'm pretty sure it's a gift for the world, for culture, for religions, 
for Israel, of course. Visitors see the Bible come to life. The altar is in the shape of a boat, a fisherman's boat. You're reminded of Jesus standing in the boat, uh, preaching uh, to the people on the shore. So for me, the whole gospel story has come alive for me here, and it will never mean the same ever again. Father Solana sees the motto of the center, Duke in Altum, Latin for go into the deep, as a message for today. Somehow Jesus tells to all of us, go into the deep, try again. You can't go, go. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a beautiful message that uh, the world needs in this moment. Financial crisis, problems with jobs, uh, many situations, and uh, we need to try again. God is on our side. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Magdala on the Sea of Galilee. Pat, talk about literally bringing the Bible to life. It's, it's marvelous, and I, I commend the Israeli archaeologists. They keep discovering some amazing things. And uh, I, I want to say, in terms of uh, archaeology, I had a course in seminary called Biblical Archaeology. It was fascinating. And uh, the findings of archaeology, to my knowledge, not one significant finding has disputed anything that's in the Bible. Uh, it's amazing how, over the years, the biblical narrative has lined up with the best the archaeologists give us. And this synagogue is just one more factor. Uh, Magdala, Mary Magdalene, I mean, it's just uh, incredible. I went to a little synagogue up in Capernaum that was much similar to the thing, but they, the things are so tiny. I mean, those synagogues were just itty bitty little things uh, compared to what we're used to in churches today. But nevertheless, that's where Jesus went. That's where he's taught, and that's where he performed miracles. Well, Israel such a, is so rich in oh, these treasures. Yeah, I mean, marvelous. everything you step on yeah. has history. <laughs> well, it's, it's amazing. Uh, my, my hat's off to the, uh, the, the Jewish archaeologists are very sensitive, and uh, they respect the uh, mm -hmm. ancient uh, cultures, and it's just beautiful what they're doing. Okay. Well, coming up, we're going to unravel the mystery of the four blood moons, find out exactly what they are and what they mean after this. What can you tell me of the prophecy? Your son is the promised king of his people. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. One of you will give me to my enemies. Blasphemers! Don't be afraid. Everything is possible with God. Son of God, February 28th, read to PG-13. Witness the story in large format theaters. Start planning your journey to the Holy Land. Come to Jerusalem. Breathe the air Jesus breathed that very night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Walk in his footsteps to Golgotha. Step inside the tomb. See the stone where his body lay. Glory to God, he is risen. Ask your pastor or visit GoIsrael.com to learn more about making the journey that will transform your faith in God and his word. Experience Israel. You'll never be the same. Tomorrow, I was a insulin dependent, five injections a day. But not anymore. How this woman and others are reversing diabetes with their diets alone. Plus, a shark attack in shallow waters. You could literally hear like the ripping sound underwater of your flesh being ripped. How this man beat the odds through the power of prayer on tomorrow's 700 Club. There's certain mysterious things that happen, and some people make a great deal of them, and some people just say, well, they're just natural phenomenon that has no significance whatsoever. So uh, I am not an expert in any of this, but we're going to show you something that you'll find very interesting. These things are called blood moons, and the appearance of a single one is not unusual, but four of them appearing closely together is extremely rare. And that's what we're going to see this year and next. And a new book written by my good friend John Hagee says these mysterious signs in the sky are indications that something big is about to happen in Israel. Eric Stackelbeck sat down to talk with the author, John Hagee, about what this could mean for the Middle East. 
The book of Genesis says God uses the sun, moon, and stars for signs and seasons. Examples can be found throughout the Bible. Think of how a star led the wise men to Jesus, or the sun stood still as Joshua led Israel to victory over its enemies. According to Pastor John Hagee, God is getting ready to speak this way once again. There's a sense in the world that things are changing, and God is trying to communicate with us in a supernatural way. I believe that in these next two years, we're going to see something dramatic happen in the Middle East involving Israel that will change the course of history in the Middle East and impact the whole world. In his latest book, Four Blood Moons, Hagee lays out what he calls celestial signals. He describes how a series of blood moons in 2014 and 2015 will have great significance for Israel. Although single blood moons are a fairly regular occurrence, four of them appearing so closely together is extremely rare. We've only seen a series of blood moons a handful of times over the past 500 years. So what exactly is a blood moon and what is the biblical significance of it? A blood moon is when the earth comes between the sun and the moon and the sun is shining through the atmosphere of the earth and cast upon the moon a red shadow. And so the moon appears to be red. Such moons appear in scripture. In the book of Joel, God says there will be wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In Acts, the apostle Peter repeats that verse from Joel. And the book of Revelation says that during the great tribulation, the moon will become like blood. Blood moons are set to appear in April 2014 on Passover and then again in September 2014 during the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. It's the same timing for 2015 for a total of four blood moons all appearing on Jewish feast days. The sun and the moon and the earth are controlled by God Almighty. He is the one that's getting them in a direct alignment on a certain day at a certain time, but each time it's a Passover or Sukkot. In the past, the rare appearance of four blood moons on these feast days has coincided with major events for Israel and the Jewish people. 1492, Spain expelled the Jews. Columbus also discovered America, which became a safe haven for the Jewish people. In each of these uh, blood moons, you have a, something that begins with a tragedy and ends in triumph. 1948, Israel is reborn as a nation. After 2,000 years, God supernaturally brought them from 66 nations, and a nation was born in a day. That again was a supernatural something that happened following the tragedy of the Holocaust. 1967, Israel wins the Six-Day War and recaptures Jerusalem. For the first time in 2,000 years, Jerusalem and the state of Israel were together again. The blood moons of 2014 and 2015 appear as Iran works towards nuclear weapons and Israel's neighbors, Egypt and Syria, are in chaos. The end game is coming with this Iranian nuclear crisis. The only reason Iran will not develop a nuclear bomb will be that Israel chooses a military solution to that crisis. I believe if that happens, that will start a series of events that will change the course of world history. If Israel does not, it will still change the course of world history. Hagee warns of the Iranian nuclear threat through his work with Christians United for Israel, which he founded in 2006. It is now the largest pro-Israel organization in America, with some 1.3 million members. He also holds Knights to Honor Israel across the country and at San Antonio's Cornerstone Church, where he serves as senior pastor. The first event in 1981 drew bomb threats and vandalism from anti-Semites, yet Hagee continues his mission. If there was ever a time for the Christians of America to stiffen their spine and stand up and speak up, it's now. To see evil and not call it evil is evil. He says it's still unclear what the coming blood moons will bring, but he is certain of one thing. When all is said and done, Israel is going to prevail. 
The flag of Israel will be flying over the walls of the city of Jerusalem when Messiah comes, and it's going to be forever. And every nation that rises up in judgment against Israel, God will punish and punish severely. Eric Stackelbeck, CBN News, San Antonio, Texas. That's quite a report. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Fascinating. Thank you, yeah, yeah, I'd never heard of a blood moon. Well, well, well watch it's, for it's that. amazing, and and uh, but boy, some big stuff coming up. Of course, the Iranians, you know, right now, I mean, they are rattling sabers. They're sending a flotilla out to the coast yeah. of America. I mean, it's crazy what they're doing, and the, I understand they're just testing a, a long-range. Uh, a uh, rocket that will probably have the, certainly hit Europe and maybe very well uh, reach the United States. I mean, they're, they're troublemakers, and the United States has just entered into this insane agreement to lift sanctions, give them all this money so they can uh, pursue their own uh, devices. Uh, but there's no question that the uh, Iranians want to do damage to Israel. They want to destroy Israel. and. Uh, I don't think we should let them do it. At least God's not going to let them do it. Exactly. Terry. Yeah. Well, up next, voices in his head drove this man to murder. It was as if I was floating in the air, looking down on someone and looking down on myself, committing this horrific act. See what shut down the voices and set this man free. Music is unpredictable. I know I have what it takes. Grace Unplugged is tremendous. A film families would enjoy seeing together. There's always going to be something missing. I think maybe you're fighting God. Just stop running. Grace Unplugged. Available February 11th. Look at this amazing before and after. See why every year Lifestyle Lift wins. Over 6 million individuals just like you have already called. These people are real. The photos untouched. Imagine what a Lifestyle Lift will do for you. Learn how easy it is today. Like the millions before you call for your free gift pack because we are the nation's number one choice for people like you who want to look and feel younger. Their stories began like yours with an easy free phone call because like you, they cared about not looking old anymore. They look amazing, youthful, and energetic. Join countless others like you. Call today because we have a special gift just for you. Our free gift pack filled with invaluable information. Call 1-800-493-3762. No credit card needed. And when you call today, you'll receive your gift pack fast because as a free bonus, we'll expedite it. And you'll get a coupon for your facial analysis. See your new look, a $300 value free. So call 1-800-493-3762 now. More than any other figure in history, Jesus of Nazareth has had a profound impact on our world. Join thousands of others for free world-class online courses available now through Luxvera, powered by Regent University. Explore the divine authority of the New Testament and the reliability of ancient texts. Understand His life and ministry. Consider the identity, relevance, and challenge of Jesus for the 21st century. Who is Jesus? Uncover truth now at luxvera.regent.edu. You say, what's Luxvera, by the way? You just saw that on the air. Luxvera is, is the uh, name of the platform for the so-called MOOC, the mass open online course that is being offered by Regent University. And this will be the first of many. And uh, it's right now, it's being offered for free. It's an incredible course, beautifully done. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people are already signing up. And uh, it's available all around the world in various languages. So if you're interested, uh, you can think Luxvera, L-U-X-V-E-R-A, Light and Truth, luxvera.regent.edu. That's easy to remember. Regent, edu. And uh, somebody will tell you more about it if you're interested. But I, th I think it, this is a fabulous course about the life of Jesus Christ. Well, I want to introduce to you, to you something. You've heard about these older women that are preying on younger boys. It, it's happening more and you can't understand it. Usually it was older men preying on young girls. but. You have uh, female teachers who are getting involved sexually with teenagers. And Mark Jenkins is one teenager. He was only 17 when a married neighbor seduced him. And as their sexual relationship grew, so did Mark's abuse of alcohol and drugs. Before long, Mark began hearing voices in his head which said, kill. 
these voices in my head were saying, you know, you've got to do it now, you've got to do it now. Kill, you got to kill. It was demonic. Mark Jenkins was born into a military family of eight. Although his mother was a Christian, his father was an alcoholic who often verbally abused his wife and children. I was used to seeing an alcoholic father more so than a normal father. When Mark was young, a female relative sexually abused him. I can remember her forcing me into certain situations, and I did not really have to respond to it. I, I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know what to say. Mark never told his mother about the incidents. She was unapproachable, and once she would leave her job, she would go to church. It seems as if she didn't have any time for me. It happened again when he was a teenager. This time, it was a woman in leadership at their church. Mark talked to the elders who handled the situation, but the scars remained. I fanned the flames of anger toward women. In high school, Mark began using alcohol, cocaine, and other drugs regularly. When he was 17, one of his neighbors, a married woman who didn't have a driver's license, asked Mark to teach her to drive. But she had other things on her mind. We would sit down for sessions of learning going through the driver's manual. Uh, she would begin to tell me more about her personal life. And uh, from that, uh, inappropriate relationship flourished. The neighbor gave him gifts, but also tried to control his life. When I would act as if I was, you know, uh, giving my attention to someone else or going somewhere else for affection, she would always uh, uh, present me with money or credit cards. I felt that I owed her something being that she was uh, giving me money. During this time, Mark says he started hearing demonic voices telling him the world was going to end and to kill his neighbor. I was speaking to the voices myself, and I was trying to throw those voices off. One evening, Mark and the woman had an argument. He went to see her, but she locked the door. Knowing that she would not let me in because we just had, you know, harsh words, you know, a few minutes before, I cut the screen door, and I'd walk throughout the house, and when she saw me, she said, Mark, she says, I'm going to call the police, and when she said that, that's when I just, I lost it. I'm thinking about, I don't want to go to jail, I hate you. Everything that was on the inside of me came out just in a matter of seconds. Mark grabbed a kitchen knife and stabbed her several times, killing her. Then he fled the house. It was as if I was floating in the air, looking down on someone or looking down on myself, committing this horrific act. Upon coming out of the house, I said to those voices, I said, now are you satisfied? I said, you know, it's done. I've taken an innocent life and uh, it was a very brutal and heinous uh, crime. Mark was arrested a week later. He was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. There, Mark developed a reputation for his violent behavior. He sold drugs and was involved in racketeering and other illegal activities. A lot of the staff, you know, they told me, you know, that, you know, you're an animal, so I began to act like an animal. A prison worship leader asked Mark if he would play guitar for the chapel band, and he reluctantly agreed. This gave him a chance to hear the Word of God on a regular basis. He also began reading the Bible, and his heart began to soften. One day, a guy asked me, he says, man, are you saved? He says, you look like you're, you're a Christian. And I cursed him. My mind automatically went back to when Peter denied Christ. But it was at that time I knew a transformation was taking place. Other people started to notice. People would tell me I had a godliness about me. And I guess the minister of music, that's what he saw in me. <laughs> One Sunday morning, a pastor gave an invitation, and Mark knew it was time. He was saying, there's just someone here God has been dealing with. And I went up, and once I'd gone up, Oh, he said, God's been waiting on you. And he prayed the sinner's prayer with me. Mark repented and says he was set free from his anger and the demonic voices in his head. That was June the 3rd, 2001. Uh, that day is forever etched in my heart. And that's why I committed my life to Christ. Mark was released after serving 26 years and now lives in the Augusta, Georgia area where he works at a manufacturing plant. He also serves faithfully in his local church 
and speaks to men every chance he gets about the transforming power of Christ. The devil meant it for evil, but God has turned it around for the good. So what I would say about God's grace and his, his unmerited favor is that it's sufficient. And if he did it for me, he can do it for you. Jesus said all manner of sins and blasphemies will be forgiven the sons of men. All manner. What have you done? <clears throat> Mark committed murder. Yes, he was doing it under the influence of some demonic suggestion, and he as a kid he'd been abused in all sorts of terrible ways, and his neighbor probably was getting, well, she was reaping what she sowed because she had sowed something terrible in his life, and, and he was rebelling against it. But nevertheless, he, this was wrong. You can't go around killing people. And the fact the devil made you do it is not an excuse in law. So he paid his price and paid the price, went to jail, lived in jail. But you know, God forgave. And God will forgive you. You ask yourself and I ask you, what have you done? And you say, you don't understand what I've done. It's horrible. It's nasty. It's terrible. I don't want to tell anybody about it. All right, well, don't tell anybody, but tell Jesus, because he knows it anyhow. And come before him and say, Lord, you know what I've done. I lay it out for you. Here it is. And I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you, Lord, to cleanse me and make me whole. I want to give you my life. You see, he died for your sin. He paid the price. I can use slang. He took the rap for you, whatever it was. He took it. He took it for Mark, and he took it for you. What have you done? You say, I, I killed my baby. Yeah, well, all right. God will forgive you. I've committed multiple adulteries. God will forgive you. I've been engaged in incest. God will forgive you. You've cheated and stolen and lied. God will forgive you. You've cursed your parents. God will forgive you. God wants you as part of his heavenly kingdom. And he died that you'd be there. So don't turn away from the Lord. Today, if you hear his voice, the Bible says, don't harden your heart, but listen to him. And he's speaking to some of you right now. And he says, come to me and I'll give you rest, I'll give you peace, and I'll give you forgiveness. Now, I want you to pray with me, and I, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. Pray these words and let the Lord do the rest. Bow your head. That's right, wherever you are right now, do it. Male, female, boy, girl, husband, wife, mother, father, whatever. Pray with me. Jesus, that's right. Jesus, you know what I've done. You know the sin I've committed. You know, oh God, the stuff that I am ashamed of. But oh God, you know it all. And I come to you and I lay it before you. And I confess to you, Lord, that I am a sinner. But I know you died for sinners and you died for me. And so, Lord, right now, I turn my heart to you and I say, come into my heart, take over my life, live in me. And from this moment on, I will live for you and I will serve you. Thank you, Lord. You've heard my prayer and have come into my heart in Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed with me, the angels of heaven are rejoicing. But you say, well, okay, I prayed with you. Now, what do I do next? And I've got something here that I think is important. It's one of those moments in time when God begins to speak. And I, I was in our control room, our audio room, and I made a compact disc, 73 minutes, that goes into great detail about the fact that you have an exchanged life, that your sins are forgiven. What about the fact if you sin again? What about forgiveness? What about the Lord's second coming? What about the, all these things? It's all in here something you want to have. And I'll give this to you free if you just call and say, look, I prayed with Pat. No financial obligation whatsoever. Just call in. Say, I have given my heart to the Lord. And again, 
the angels of heaven are rejoicing over this decision you've just made. It's a toll-free number, 1-800-759-0700. It's easy to remember. Call in right now. Somebody's here who loves you. Terry? Well, coming up later, financial columnist Michelle Singletary shares her top three tax tips for 2014. Stay tuned. We'll be back. Are you thinking about giving up, ready to quit? There are times in life when all we can see is where we are today. But God sees the whole picture. He knows your tomorrow, and He has a plan for you. I was having some pains between my shoulder blades. At that point, everything changed. Diagnosis, pancreatic cancer. First, there was prayer. The second is to fight. As soon as we walked through those doors at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, all my anxiety left. The pastoral care here is based on the Bible, based on the Word of God, just as it is at our own church. When you combine the great medicine with the spiritual resources we have, it provides the patients with something that really can make a difference. You got a pastor right there on staff praying with patients, and whether it be scripture or whether it just be a word of encouragement to say, God's got this. If you or someone you love is fighting complex or advanced stage cancer, go to cancercenter.com forward slash faith. You'll learn how our treatment results compare to national averages and see a list of insurance plans with which we've worked. Advanced medicine and technology, the warm embrace of the spirit. I firmly believe God led me here. Call or go to cancercenter.com. Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Care that never quits. Appointments available now. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Christian artist Carmen says he's cancer free. He shared the good news on Facebook, telling friends and fans that it appears the rare form of cancer is now gone. He wrote, quote, they took tests and could find no trace of cancer. That's amazing. He went on to thank his fans for their support and prayers. Quote, you all have been the best friends, brothers, sisters, and prayer warriors I could ever hope for in this life. Carmen says he is still healing, but will be working on the release of his new album and an upcoming tour. Good for him. We're so happy. Well, another well-known name in Christian music, Darlene Check, updated fans on her battle with breast cancer. On her most recent blog, she wrote, she's finished round one of five chemo treatments, and all she can say is grace, grace, and more grace, even though she says she is losing some hair. She went on to say through this, she is learning to rest in every promise from Jesus. She told fans it's his word that is strengthening her. She also says writing has been a great comfort to her, and she plans to share songs birthed from this trial. We can't wait for that. Darlene, our prayers are with you as well. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website, that's cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Come to the Holy Land and walk in the footsteps of Jesus. From Nazareth to the birthplace of his ministry, the shores of Galilee. Stand where he stood. Be baptized in the Jordan River. Hallelujah, he is everlasting. Ask your pastor or visit GoIsrael.com to learn more about making the journey that will transform your faith in God and his word. Experience Israel. You'll never be the same. Tomorrow, I was a insulin dependent, five injections a day. But not anymore. How this woman and others are reversing diabetes with their diets alone. Plus, a shark attack in shallow waters. You could literally hear like the ripping sound underwater of your flesh being ripped. How this man beat the odds through the power of prayer on tomorrow's 700 Club. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Well, you've heard it Pat said by Pat many times here, 21 days. That's the time it takes to break a habit or, for that matter, to form a good new one. Well, recently, Washington Post columnist Michelle Singletary went on a 21-day financial fast, and nearly 1,000 people on Facebook and Twitter went with her. Take a look. There are many spiritual and physical benefits to fasting. 
money expert and Washington Post columnist Michelle Singletary says fasting your finances is just as valuable. With her 21-day field-tested financial fast, Michelle helps people break bad spending habits, get rid of debt, build savings, and find financial freedom and prosperity. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Michelle Singletary. It's great to have you oh, back I'm here. So welcome. I'm so glad to be here. You just finished a 21-day fast in January. Now, talk about that a little bit. What does that entail? Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> and I created it. <laughs> so for 21 days, you can't do any unnecessary shopping or spending. Now, what qualifies as unnecessary? So just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> I should ask you the opposite. What yeah, do you spend so on? So you can uh, buy groceries and medicine and things that are essential to life your household, life-sustaining. Mm -hmm. But other than that, everything else is, has to go. Wow. And we do so much unconscious spending that people don't even realize that they're spending. And you can't use plastic. No credit during the fast. Cash only. Cash only. Because I want people to get back in touch yeah. with what it means to have limitations. And, and you say that we spend differently, when we, <laughs> even if it's a debit card we right. spend differently when it's just a card to hand to someone because the way they created it you just swipe and spend mm -hmm. without really thinking about it I mean I talk to people all the time and if you have to spend 20 or 50 dollars you kind of think whoa what am I doing here but when it's the card you just swipe it and and it is psychologically removed. there right. is a difference that's yeah. right because you're removing yourself from the payment part of mm -hmm. it because you don't have to pay until later yeah. Uh, and so people tend to get into trouble really quickly. Even those people who pay off their cards every month, studies show that you still spend more when you use plastic than when you use cash. So when you do this fast, do you keep a little book with you and a pencil and kind of write down everything that you're spending? You do. I mean, that comes after the fast. You do a spending journal. But the way the book is uh, set up is that you read one chapter a day. And at the end of the day, there's an assignment. And I ask people to journal because, you know, journaling is a good way for you to talk to difference. yourself and sure. to talk to God and so every day just one chapter a day it takes maybe 15 minutes yeah. and there's a there's a topic each day about saving and tithing and teaching your children about money and marriages healing yeah. marriages um, I, I mean it's so incredible how this thing can change people's lives how people were tweeting me because um, I'm on Twitter, like mm -hmm. so many people, Singletary M, that they tie for the first time. One woman said that during the fast, she realized how much extra she was spending and she added it up. It was her tie. Really? The amount that she saved was the amount that she thought that she couldn't tie. Yeah. What do you think is the most valuable lesson learned through the fast? That it's not about you. Mm -hmm. That people want to have so much. You know, they want prosperity, but it's, real, they, it's, it's a selfish prosperity. So they can have more of what they want. That's right. So they can have more of what you want. This fast is not yeah. about that. You know, it came out, this fast was created out of my church, which is First Baptist Church of Glen Arden in Maryland. And it's a ministry to help people become financially secure. Mm -hmm. And so what, you, what they find out is that, you know what? I, I want to do this for my church. I want to do this for my family and my community. It allows you to have more money to help people past just your family. Because isn't really this is about, you know, it's not about us. Because all this stuff is going to go away. It's going to rust, like it says right. in Matthew. But I want to encourage people to do the fast so that they can help not just their family, but other people. Somebody who's lost their job, you mm -hmm. can help them during this time. Yeah, I, as I was reading your book, I was thinking that it, it all it's a mind shift in your money is something for you to utilize, not something right. that utilizes you. And That's most right. of us live the opposite of that, That's don't right. we? Oh my gosh, you so got the point of the fast. That's yeah, exactly it, it's right. It's really quite amazing. We're, it's tax time. Everybody's yes. thinking about taxes and hoping for a return. <laughs> <laughs> what are some tax tips you can give us? Well, the first thing is that if you make $58,000 or less, there's a way for you to get your taxes done for free. It's called mm -hmm. Free File. You just go to the IRS website. You have to go to the IRS website and their partners that they've partnered up with private companies that will do your taxes for free your federal and in many cases your state and I think this is so important for people who don't know how to file yeah. or they make mistakes afraid they're gonna miss something exactly yes. and mm -hmm. so they should absolutely take advantage of free file and, and if you don't 
qualify for that, the IRS also has volunteers that will do your taxes. Um, and next thing is this time of year, be so careful of tax uh, scams because they, they're sending you emails, they're sending you things, oh, how I can boost your refund. And really, it's just a way to get your yeah. personal information to cheat you. So just don't respond to any of those. The IRS will not contact you that way. Just delete them. Don't even open mm -hmm. them. And then lastly, this year, because the IRS has had so many issues with the sequestration and things like that, you can't call the ask, where's your money? So you should use where's my refund on the IRS website, and it'll track how long it takes for you to get your refund. Yeah. And if you do electronically and direct deposit, you can get your refund in three weeks or maybe even less. Mm -hmm. So just follow that. They won't be taking your questions about that because they want you to do it yourself, and you really can. You can go online and do all of it. As we're in this, this time of hearing daily in the news about insurance and everybody has to have it and, and choices have changed up, but we all know we need to do something long term, especially, you know, we're hearing about the boomers all retiring now. Long term care savings. You say that's a significant thing to pay attention to. It is long-term care savings and long-term care insurance. I mean, I added a, a chapter in my book all about that because I ask people, "What's your long-term plan?" Yeah. And most then, people have one? No, yeah. they don't. Who's going to take care of you? Who's going to pay for that? Because Medicare does not pay for long-term yeah. care. So you do have to have some savings to help you in your elder mm -hmm. years, um, or you have to have really good relationships with your children. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings me to legacy. You talk right. about leaving a financial legacy. Why is that important? It's so important. And, and here's the thing. When I say that, I don't mean just leaving money, mm -hmm. because Scripture's clear about that. You don't want to leave money to people who are going to mismanage God's resources. You spend all your life building up these resources and you're going to leave it to your tray for the kids and family who are going to waste sure this. They know what to do That's with it, right. right. So teach your children how to handle money well. Teach them to tithe. Teach them to give before they do anything else. And you know, Scripture says, if you train them up, yeah. they'll follow you. Well, and you have many wonderful and creative ideas on how to do that in a very user-friendly, family-generating way, right. really. It's, it, Michelle's book is called The 21-Day Financial Fast. It's available nationwide, filled with wonderful information that will help you use your money, not be used by it. Thank That's you right. so Thank much. Thank you so Great much. You oh, it's today. my pleasure. Wonderful. Well, up next, we've got your email questions. Madison wants to know, is it a sin if I forget to say my prayers before I eat? Pat's going to chew on that question and more when we bring it on. We'll be back. <laughs> I use catheters, and if you do too, please listen carefully to this life-changing breakthrough. There is a new catheter that hurts less, and you can get a free sample by calling this number now. Pain and urinary tract infections have been avoided by many of my patients. These new disposable catheters hurt less. It's an incredible new design that reduces pain. The eyelets are polished, so they glide smoothly and effortlessly across your sensitive skin. The old catheters would scrape and cut, causing pain and infections. These new catheters are totally different, so smooth and painless, they changed my life. Call now and get a free sample. Medicare and your insurance will pay for up to 200 of these catheters per month, all at little or no cost to you. Call now for your free sample, complete with a 90-day supply, and if it doesn't reduce your pain, we'll pick them up for free. Call 800-212-2624. That's 800-212-2624. Call now. Music is unpredictable. I know I have what it takes. Grace Unplugged is tremendous. A film families would enjoy seeing together. There's always going to be something missing. I think maybe you're fighting God. Just stop running. Grace Unplugged. Available February 11th. Well, I promised you we were going to get to your email, so let's get started with let's that. Go for it. Yeah. This is Madison Pat, who says, Sometimes I forget to pray before I eat my food. After I'm almost finished, I'll remember to pray. Is it a sin if I forget to say my prayers before I eat? Madison, it isn't a sin if you pray or don't pray. You know, when we used to work in Colombia, we would pray and don't let the food hurt us. <laughs> Because there's so many things, so many it's diseases. A good in many places. Know, so uh, that wasn't sinful. That was just self-preservation. But I think the Lord knows your heart, and you eat the food with gratitude, and you know there's a prayer in your heart. So, it, it, yeah. okay. This is C. N. who writes. 
Suppose I find my soulmate. Am I obligated to marry that person and have children? Truth be told, I think of marriage as more of a prison than a union, and I don't really want children. Would God be accepting of a common law marriage where my husband and I have sex, but we do not have kids? Or would this prevent us from being taken into heaven when the rapture comes? You are a crazy mixed up kid, <laughs> I'm telling you. No, that, that um, let's start the whole thing. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about a soulmate. I don't know where all this stuff comes from, but there's no such thing as a soulmate. So you, are you obligated to marry your so-called soulmate? Well, there is no such thing mm -hmm. in biblical terms that I'm aware of. Do you know I, anything yeah, in the Bible? I, no, not okay. at all. All right, so that's yeah, number one. That's number one. <laughs> so no, you're not obligated. Now, you say, I, I don't want to have kids, but I like to have sex. Well, that's fine. But um, you will have kids if you have sex, <laughs> but you don't have to necessarily. Right. <laughs> um, the, the Catholics practice what they call rhythm. There are also ways of, of you know, using birth control that you don't, not, your sexual activity does not necessarily lead to procreation. Um, but common law, why not get married? I mean, yeah, you get a lot of benefits from being married and you want to solemnitize this union. You just don't want to say, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm getting a common law union. The whole thing is, is, is your thinking is, is just confused on this area. Yeah, it's very I, 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 mm -hmm. I don't want this, I want that. I don't want, you're not a very good candidate for marriage, if you ask me. Well, you know, for this cause, a man will leave yeah. his mother and father, cleave his wife, twain one flesh. And they live together, and out of that comes a union of, of, of godly children. But uh, if, if you don't have children, I don't think it's a sin to use birth control. But at the same time, I, I do think that you should get married. I mean, why, why go common law? You don't have to. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go down to the justice of priest and get a license. You don't have to have a big church wedding if you don't want to. Right. But I, I think you should solemnify the relationship. All right. Okay, this is Cassie who says, how can you tell the difference between God's voice and your own thoughts? Does he answer you with words, feelings, or pictures? Um, that is an extraordinarily good question because uh, that's a question we all wonder about. We see through a glass darkly, then face to face. And, um, you know, the Apostle Paul said, and I think I have the mind of the Lord. I mean, even the Apostle Paul writing the Bible said, I think I have the mind of the Lord, talking about the relationship of men and women. All right, um, how do you know? Through reason of use, you have your senses exercised to determine good from evil. You walk with God, you get used to hearing the voice of God, and you try to live out those things, and then it's trial and error. Sometimes you miss it, sometimes you don't. God isn't mad at you at a little child because the little child's trying to walk and he falls down every so often. Yeah. So it's, it's a walk and you begin to walk with the Lord and little by little you hear the voice of the Lord saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Here's one for you. Oh, good. <clears throat> this is a viewer who says, I met my husband in church at a time when I was a virgin. He was divorced with two kids, having left his wife after she cheated on him. Within weeks, I was living with him and got pregnant by him. We have since married and have been together three years, but now I feel like I betrayed God because I didn't marry a virgin, had premarital sex, and had a child out of wedlock. My husband and I get along great and never argue, but I feel like I should start over. Should I stay married or leave him and become celibate? Wow. Um, Dissect that You know, one. it's amazing. <laughs> this guy's a Christian, and yet it's a woman, he, eh? he is uh, uh, he, this man, and he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's married, and he's seducing a girl two weeks after he meets her. I mean, they're having sex. He said, within two weeks, wasn't it? Two mm -hmm. weeks. She said, within weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, weeks. Mm -hmm. I said, two, within weeks. I mean, he must have really put the move on you pretty heavy, and you must have been pretty willing on the whole thing. All right, but... Subsequent, the fact that you weren't a virgin or he wasn't a virgin, that's got nothing to do with marriage. Uh, that, that there's nothing in the Bible that, that disqualifies somebody. Well, you got married, you weren't a virgin. I don't know anything in the Bible that talks about that. Mm -hmm. That was fine for Mary. She was a virgin, but her, her, she, what was in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. All right. So uh, you've been married. You have a child. You have a, what a parent is a Christian husband. The, the reason for his divorce was infidelity of the spouse. Right. So uh, that's okay. And I see no reason why you shouldn't live a happy married life. You're doing okay together. So rejoice in what you have. 
and don't be coming up with all these um, these spurious problems. I mean, you, you know, you, so far so good. You made some mistakes. You you know mm -hmm. you did something wrong, but you have rectified that, and now you're living according to God's law in holy matrimony. So enjoy it. Praise the Lord. Yeah, forgive yourself. Forgive I mean, God yourself. You. Forgive God yourself. will forgive you. Yeah. And but it's over. You, I mean, get on with it. And no, you don't want to divorce and break up and start all over again. That makes no sense at all. All right. Okay. This is Jamie who says, "I was treated rudely by a restaurant employee the other day. I know that as a Christian, I have to quote turn the other cheek. I don't want to get anyone fired, but I also don't think it's right for employees to treat customers poorly. I would appreciate some good advice." All right, as somebody who happens to have um, a hotel here at uh, Regent University where we have a very fine restaurant and employees, uh, the question is, uh, we train the, the, the employees to be courteous to people. And I think the owner of that restaurant would appreciate the fact that you said, look, I, I like your food, you've got a nice restaurant, but this particular employee was very surly and uh, off-putting, and I think that it he or she did it to me, they'll do it to others. So I just want to tell you so you can correct the situation. But uh, I think that's a helpful suggestion that most uh, owners of a business would appreciate a great mm. deal. Yeah. So if they fire that <coughs> stuff up. Maybe to encourage him to, to train his people well, because of course. at the Founders Inn, you would never get a surly <laughs> the waiter and waitress. Be <laughs> no, but we, we had uh, uh, one of the finest organizations in the country training our employees when we first mm -hmm. opened up. I mean, yeah, they're amazing. And, and but they make a big thing of it. Good morning, Mr. Smith. I mean, that, the, the good businesses all want to cultivate the favor of their customers, mm -hmm. and they want to treat them right, make them feel special, because they want them to come back. Right. And they exactly. appreciate their business. Exactly. So if you've got a certainly employee, what that employee is doing is undermining the premise of your business, which Absolutely. is to provide service. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> That's all the time we have for so email questions. Tell the owner. <laughs> go to the owner and say, listen, I mean, I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but here's a problem. And, I, you know. It'll be appreciated. It will, it will <laughs> I hope. If it isn't, then the guy shouldn't, should not be in business. All right. Well, right now, I would like to introduce you to a single mom named Lola. Her husband deserted her and their six children. Lola had a dream. And thanks to people like you, that dream came true. Every day in her small home in Kyrgyzstan, Lola bakes bread to feed her six children. Years ago, her alcoholic husband abandoned the family, and Lola has struggled ever since to make ends meet. I can't even buy bread because it is expensive for me, so I bake it by myself. We have it every day, and sometimes it's all we have. Lola works cleaning houses, and her oldest son makes bricks, but they earn very little. We do our best to work, but still we don't have enough money for food. For four years I have dreamed of having a cow, but I've never had enough money to buy one. Orphan's Promise sponsors a training center for children here. Sabina, Lola's daughter, started attending the English and Bible courses that were offered. When we learned about all of her family's struggles and problems, we took them food, clothing, and school supplies. During the Bible classes, Sabina learned about the power of prayer. I began praying for us to live happily and to have everything we need in our home. Sabina knew her prayers had been answered when we gave the family a cow, hens, and a refrigerator. I'm very grateful for a hen, the refrigerator, and the cow. These gifts mean so much to us. We started selling milk and making money. The hens lay eggs, and my children like eating them very much. All of us have good food every day, and that makes me rejoice. I am very thankful to the people who helped us, and I am grateful to God for... That's you, 700 Club members. We say thank you for caring and giving. It's great. Kurdistan. Kurdistan. All right. <laughs> well, we leave you with now with today's Power Minute from John. Jun Ho was born with a severe cleft lip and palate. He had a hard time eating, so he was small for his age. And as hard as the Ma's tried to save money for cleft lip surgery, they could never afford it. Then they heard about CBN. We offered to help provide cleft lip and palate surgery for Jun Ho. There was a ray of light in our dark world. When other people went out of their way to avoid us, 
CBN came to us from far away to help. These are the things you make possible when you partner with CBN. Thousands of people around the world begin new lives because you cared enough to give. To those of you who recently pledged to join the 700 Club, thank you. Your help will make a tremendous difference in so many lives. Be sure to watch for this mailing and remember to send in your pledge because when we all come together to help, miracles.